Hey, I'm Rachel Billingsley. And I'm Luke Billingsley. And this is GMT Talk, our insider podcast where we talk about all things GMT. Today on GMT Talk, we will be interviewing Mark McLaughlin, an accomplished designer, author, and friend of GMT. Mark has published seven games with GMT, the most recent of which was Ancient Civilizations of the Middle East in 2023. V for Valentine. Nice. I, as a journalist, I had dinner once with Nimoy, with a few other journalists. Whoa. Wow. And, and John Delancey, by the way, they were together. And one of the younger journalists at the table asked, Mr. Nimoy, how did you come up with that? All of us groan, because we all know the story. <laughs> but Nimoy, to his credit, with a straight face says, super glue. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and as you know, he grew up in the West End of Boston, which is now, which used to be the Jew, like the Jewish area of Boston. It's now Boston Medical. Uh, and But his, his rabbi at his, lo- at his local temple would give a blessing like this. And oh. so Nimoy, and Nimoy was in the Jewish theater groups in the, the old Vaudeville Jewish theaters in that part of the town. And that's he developed it there from from there. Um, wow. Interesting. But anyway, I I've, I also had lunch once with Sulu uh, with two other journalists. I've twice been kissed by Uhuru, uh, <laughs> and she is and she was every bit as beautiful as you could imagine. Hmm. Uh, I shook hands with Scotty Chekhov and Bones, uh, and with Picard, and with Khan. Wow. I shook hands with Khan uh, <laughs> and with. Uh, uh, General Mardoff, um, Marduk, who, uh, if you remember from the next from Next Generation, he was this really growly general. Mm-hmm. And I asked him how he got the part, and he said, "Well, I was raised by a Quaker mother in a Quaker school, and she taught Latin. And I usually been in cowboy movies and cop movies, so I went in for the interview, and they said, you know, we want you to you know, deliver a spe- some kind of a speech in Klingon." And he says, I don't know Klingon, but I know Carthago de Lenda Est, uh, you know, Cato's famous speech from uh, Carthage, from the Roman Wars. So I did it with growling. Carthago de Lenda Est. And you got it. And, of course, Carthago de Lenda Est is, leads us into my next game, <laughs> Hannibal's Revenge. Hey, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which parts of Hannibal's Revenge do you find the most fun? For people Killing Romans. At? Killing Romans, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Always Perfect. fun. Yeah. Hey, the, the, the look at the title. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I've always liked the underdogs of history. Hmm. All right. And uh, like I said, just this, just this week, I watched the Victor Mature movie of Hannibal from the 50s, you know, uh, which I've seen many times and along with other things. But no, uh, my favorite part of it is the, um, the interaction uh, of the cards and uh, you and when you get together to fight, um, there's so much involved because you have. It's like when you fight the battles, it's like the old game of war as a kid. To which you add dice, to which you add cards, mm-hmm. so it's war on steroids. Uh, mm-hmm. So you never know how it's going to turn out because there are so many variables. You can't, like in many hex encounter games, you can count factors. I don't know it's a three to one, it's a four to one. In these, you never know what card the other guy's going to play. You never know what cards he has. And, of course, nobody knows what the dice are going to do. Um, so every time he, I mean, yeah, obviously, if I have a better general, if I have more event cards, if, yeah, the odds are stacked in my favor. But there's an old saying that you can't have a Kane uh, without a Varro. In other words, Hannibal couldn't have pulled off the greatest victory in military history if he hadn't been been, been, game, been playing against an idiot. Mm. Um, and so again, odds are if you look at, if you look at that on paper, eighty thousand Romans and Latins, forty thousand assorted people from him, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, okay, that's 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 easily two to one. All right, but there's so many variables and factors. Uh, involved in a battlefield. I mean, when you get to a battle, you know, the under the, the the small army often wins because they're lucky, or they're an army of sheep, but they're led by a lion, mm-hmm. which is much better a, uh, than an army of lions led by a sheep. <laughs> um, and as Napoleon said, I'd rather have my generals be lucky than good. Yeah. Um, wow. So 
Yeah, so I like it. Says so every time you get to do something, there's no one guy has an advantage over something, but it's never a done deal. You yeah. never know, and it can, and the game can turn on a dime. Uh, you know, so you can be knocked back, make comebacks. It's very fluid, mm -hmm. um, and because you win by taking, well, if you take Rome and Carthage at the same time, one guy, if you're Rome and you have Carthage, or you're Carthage and you have Rome, because the game's over. But otherwise, you have a hand of you you have a hand of cards, and you're trying to get up to twelve or down to zero. If you get a guy, so every time he loses things, he loses cards. If his hand size is zero or less, game's over. Or if I get to twelve and he's at three or less, it's over. Or you go through the whole three 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 rounds of play. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of ways to win it and end it. And so the game is never the same game. There's no and with all the different variations of cards that are available. Mm -hmm. there's no perfect game and yeah. every game every game is different because you know you don't know what the, how the cards are going to come out how the cards are going to be dealt um you have you have this you have uh, suits of cards for your side gauls and, and carthaginians romans and latins you know the deck of cards each one's a suit of cards 13 cards but you shuffle them up and you don't know and you draw cards you don't know which cards you're going to get in your hand at which time mm -hmm. the event cards there are cards only the romans can try to get there are cards only the Carthaginians try to get. There are cards both sides can get, but all those cards aren't always available. Mm -hmm. There's an array. There's six of six Roman cards, six Carthaginian cards, six shared cards that are available. And if I want, if I'm a Carthaginian player and I want, I want the elephant card. The Roman says, "Nope, we're going to fight for it." And you fight the same way you'd fight a battle by using by using cards to see if you get it or not. Uh -huh. um, so and it's the same it's the same mechanism as Hitler's Reich. But unlike it was Reich, where all cards were available at the same time, or most of the time, in the Hannibal game, there are only a few, a time, a few available at a time. So you can't sit down and play like, oh, I'm Hitler's Reich, I want the SS, I want the Tigers, I want Rommel. In, the, in Hannibal, you can't do that, because, you know, the elephants might be buried in the bottom of the deck. Mm -hmm. uh, the Libyan spearmen, um, Scipio, not there. Um, so you don't, you only have to you have constant choices of what you want and if I can get it. And also when you, you have you, you, your cards are, are numbered from uh, up, up to 13 and it's like, well, do I play my best card? Cause I definitely want that. Or do I play a lousy card hoping to draw out his best card? Mm -hmm. So you have a little bit of the bluff game, a little poker. in it all. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of things going on. Uh, and it's, it's, it's solitaire or up to four players. You can have a team of two people on each side or two versus one or, solitaire against the, the system um so it, it's a lot of ways to play it and it, it, again it's never the same game twice hmm. never never even close to the same game twice and i'm playing a game of uh, mark simonish's um hannibal where all the battles are being fought out in miniatures uh and i'm one of the, and there's three of us on each side and i'm mark dribble as opposed to mouse dribble uh and i own <laughs> every one of my uh, things with roma delenda est <laughs> nice. yeah I, I i'm no bias here but um no i have i have i have painted armies of romans i have painted armies of carthaginians Gaul, you name it i got painted armies i got fifteen thousand soldiers uh but i have lots and lots of ancients uh and which is why whenever i do an ancients game like commanding colors ancients for gmt i don't use blocks I put toys on the table. I put paint, little painted. You want Romans? I got Romans. You want elephants? Here's an elephant. You want a chariot? What? You want a you want a, a Syrian chariot, a Babylonian chariot, an Egyptian chariot? You know, a, a Britannic chariot. What kind of chariot do you want? I got them all. Name them. I have eighty chariots, um, all little ones. Look at this thing. So, <laughs> but uh, again, I'm a miniatures gamer who uh, designs board games and plays card games and computer games. So when you were working like on uh, Hannibal's Revenge, you used miniatures for that too, and like the ancient series. Yeah, and because I mean, oh, I use I use miniatures for the generals. I mean, okay. the, to, to mark the since it's a game with the wooden discs, I tend to put the wooden discs in there for the generals because because Hannibal's Revenge has generals. Um, okay. So I have I have I have little painted generals. Um, cool. For Napoleonic like Wars was always the soldiers. Um, for um, Hitler's Reich. Uh, I used risk. I, I did use risk soldiers. I used German soldiers, British soldiers, you know, instead of the discs. So, Mark, tell us about your trip last year to Europe. I love traveling. I love going to museums. Um, like in, in in London in September, I spent two entire days in the British Museum. I was the first person there at ten, and with a ticket, 
And at five, I was ushered out both days. And I saw the Rosetta Stone. And I saw the wing bulls of Assyria. I saw the face of Ashurbanipal. I saw the bust of Ramesses. Wow. On that, you know, and that's just the start. You know, and then you, I mean, there's there's the Sutton Who helmet. Um, there's all this kind of stuff, you know, from all over the, the world that the British, okay, the British have an, an, you know, there's an old joke. Why are the pyramids in England, in Egypt? Why are the pyramids in Egypt? They're too heavy to steal. You got it. Good girl. All right. Yes. Two, <laughs> two points for Rachel. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the British have changed their thing that they don't admit to having stolen things. Mm. They are holding them in trust. <laughs> which is so, like is if like your neighbor decided to take your car put it in his garage and hold it in trust for you <laughs> mm. and not let you yeah. and then charge you to see it yep <laughs> <laughs> but again i i and uh i really hope to, to see dr irving finkel because he's the the leading um expert on babel he speaks babylonian he reads babylonian wow. uh and he tra and he's also a gamer he translated the first board game ever made the royal Game of Ur, which you can buy in their shop or you can buy online at Amazon or you can make your own. It's pretty easy. And the rules fit on a tab, a cuneiform ta tablet that fits in your hand. Str you know, it took about one page rules. This is one clay tablet <laughs> rule. Yeah. And if you go online and, and just Google him, he plays, he teaches the game to people and he's very delightfully snarky about it. Um, this is a man who built an arc, a half size arc. Wow. In the Ganges, not the Ark of the Bible, but the Ark of Ur, hmm. because the, the 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 story goes way back before the in the Bible started written like started about 700 BC when the and the when the, when the kept building in captivity. These goes back 3,000 years before that. Um, so I love that museum. But as you know, I do a lot of stuff on Napoleon. I've done three games for you guys on Napoleon. Uh, the very first game I had published was War and Peace for Avalon Hill, which was then redone. A few years, that was 40 years ago. It was redone a fifth and again a sixth edition by one small step games who did a double sized map, uh, blew it up. Gorgeous. Every instead of silhouettes of soldiers, that is the soldiers in their uniforms, and every mm -hmm. uniform is correct. I'm gonna, I went over every one of them with uh, the artist, uh, a, a guy, a Spanish, Antonio Pinar from Spain. And just, it's the same game I did, plus more. And they made a computer game of it, uh, which is now called Napoleon's Eagles. So in August, to, for the launch of the game, the, the publisher in, in, in Lyon, uh, in, in France, invited me to come over. Ooh. And said, so we'll do some promo work. So first thing I did was I go to the Musée de l'Amie Royale in Brussels, an amazing museum of everything from Charlemagne to NATO. Uh, I mean, they have the World War One exhibit. They have four tanks in the building. A whippet, That's so cool. A whippet, a Mark IV, a little tiny uh, Italian thing, which looks like a little one-man turret, uh, and another one. Um, and uh, just an entire floor, just of World War One stuff, and uniforms, the whole works. And every area is different. There's one, you know, I mean, there's knights and banners and you know muskets and you, know, you name it. It's there. So I get to the Napoleonic Museum exhibit. I'm dying to get here, right? It's a red rope and a sign, under construction, no admittance. Ugh. So I look, and I can see the cases. And I think there's still stuff in the cases. And I, and I, and I look to the left, I look to the right. There's nobody there. I step over the line. <laughs> I start walking I start walking down. I'm looking at cases. And, you know, and I hear, Monsieur, Monsieur, parlez-vous français? I go, no. <laughs> No, Monsieur, Monsieur, parlez-vous anglais? I said no, I'm an American. <laughs> you you cannot be there. Is 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 not is not open to public. I said I know. I'm okay though. I know this stuff. <laughs> but Monsieur, is it, it, is not allowed. It's not possible. I said that's okay. I mean, I, I but there's the fifth chasseurs and that's the fifth Corossier. I, I know that banner over there. You know, you cannot be. He, he comes down. And he says, sir, I must escort you out. I said, well, look, I'm a third of the way down already. So rather than turn around and come back, how about we just go make the whole circuit back out? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, oh, monsieur, it's not I said, please, I've come all the way. I've flown 3,000 miles. I designed Napoleonic games. I paint Napoleonic soldiers. This is a big day for me. 
So, okay, monsieur, but we must hurry. I said, well, you know, I'm 70 years old. I move a little slow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm shuffling, you know, and he's putting his arm around my shoulder and holding my elbow. And, you know, I, occasionally I go, <clears throat> and we, we, we get to the end of the exhibit where the red rope is, and he undoes the ropes and shuffles me over. And I cross the rope. And I then turn around, stand up, click my heels, go, Vive le bra! And I march <laughs> off a double quick. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and leave the guy in the dust. You know, the emperor would have been proud. Oh, my goodness. Um, and then the next day, I went to Waterloo, uh, which is, of course, you know, I've, I've done the Battle of Waterloo. The very first miniatures things I ever did with my friend Nino when I was 15 years old was paint up Airfix miniatures to do our own little version, made up rules of the Battle of Waterloo. Mm. I, I've done the Battle of Waterloo in miniatures, in computers, in board games. Probably the only thing about I've done, even more than I've done Gettysburg. You know, whether you're a miniatures gamer or a board gamer, at some point in your life, you're going to do Waterloo, 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 Waterloo. Very first Avon Hill game I played, the very first real war game, Waterloo. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. And it's a hot, it's a hot September day, 90 degrees. All right, blazing sun. I go there, I get in the museum. The museum's underground, and it's a wonderful museum. It's got audio, visual, 3D, all kinds of things, uniforms, beautifully done. And then I started going to walk the battlefield. And the first thing I do is I climb the, the mound. Now, there's a mound which is 265 steps up to, up to oh. the, the top. When Wellington saw it, because they did it in 1828, he says, what have you done to my battlefield? You've ruined it. Because the mound wasn't there. <laughs> but you get to the top, and you can see everything. But at the very top is a 28-ton bronze British lion with one paw on the globe. Talk <laughs> about compensation. Um, you know. <laughs> wow. Okay. And then you climb back down, and you walk a whole battlefield. I did everything. I went all the way. I went to Hogamon. I went to Paplot. I went to you know, the, the, the sand pit. I went to everything. Um, I went to... You know, and. At Waterloo, there were three armies. There were the French, there were the Prussians, and the Anglo-Allied, of whom a third were British. The rest were Hanoverians and Nassaus and all these other things. You'd never know there was anybody on that field with the British. Hmm. There's not a single monument to the French, not a single French cannon, nothing about, no mention of the Prussians. There's one monument to Hanoverians, which is across the road outside the park. Uh, it's a plinth. You know, <laughs> and everywhere you go, you know, statues of British guys, just there's plaques of British guys, there's British cannons. Except I'm walking back the line from Hogamont back to the mound along the line, which was uh, just now the, the ridge of Waterloo is not a real ridge in the way we think of ridge, it's a very low, long slope and a very slight thing. It's just enough to basically hide behind from artillery, but it's not a big ridge like a big, you know, hill or something like that. And there's this little stone, very badly worn, no taller than my knee. And I knelt down and I splashed some water on it because it was a little dirty. And I read it. Poor Lieutenant Edouard Drouet. You know, Nivelles, which is 20 miles away. Blessé, which means wounded. Eilau, Friedland, Hanau, Leipzig. He's wounded in those places. Mort, a key. Wow. Wow. And the monument was to he he was a, he he led the ch a charge of a squadron of the fifth cuirassiers, and he got the farthest penetration of any French unit in the Battle of Waterloo, right there in front of Mercer's battery. Hmm. And there's that one little thing, and the, the bottom is it's you know in memory of Lieutenant Roy and the brave cavaliers of the fifth cuirassier erected by the, his family. And I hmm. I cried. Wow. I'm an old soldier, and that touched me. And then, I, of course, after Waterloo, I go to I take the bullet train down to Lyon, and I stay at a lovely hotel. And there's a big a Place a Carnot in memory of the of the French revolutionary leader. And there's a monument there to Verdun, and there's a monument to the 44 children who were massacred in that spot by the Nazis. 44 mm -hmm. Jewish children were shot in that park. And of course, around it is all these wonderful restaurants. Um, and you know, I have calm having sit down to have coffee uh, with, with Philippe, and we're talking to the waitress, and it turns out she's from Corsica. Guess who else is from Corsica? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Napoleon, obviously. <laughs> and so then he says to me, Philippe says, well, to celebrate, we must do les bouchons. I said, what are les bouchons? He says, do you know what a pub crawl is? I said, I'm Irish. Of course I know what a pub crawl is. <laughs> he, says, oh, he says, but it's like that, but we don't drink. We eat. We go from oh, restaurant yeah. to restaurant and have a small plate everywhere. I said, how long does this go on? Until we explode! <laughs> <laughs> and so we start, and we're going, and there's a salad, there's a salad, I have to start a salad, the Lyonnais, of course, because it's a Lyon, and then we have to have the frog's legs, and we have to have the chicken this, and we have to have de la pan, which is basically bunny stew. Mm -hmm. And we're going all the way through this, and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just stuffed. I said, I said, Philippe, I can't take anymore. I'm going to explode. Oh, but we must have profiteroles. This is Lyon. We are famous for profiteroles. It's a dessert, by the way. I said, okay, good. We'll have two each. I, was, I got back to the hotel. Within 15 minutes, I was in a food coma for the next eight hours. Yeah, I, but I love the French. By the way, he said to me, Monsieur Mark, we have a 10% discount for Americans who do not try to order in French. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because I've studied six languages. I suck at all of them. I did take... Um, five years of French from eighth grade through senior year of high school and which I should have stuck with and I can read French and I, the first book I did um, um, sorry the second book I did The Wild Geese about the Irish brigades of France and Spain I did the research in French and Spanish because right? I can read French and Spanish I just can't speak it but I honed up on it and in 1980 my wife uh, we married two years by then we went to I told her I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order a meal in French in Paris she goes no, don't do this to me I said, you know, trust me. He says, no. I said, well, tell you what, I'll do a practice run. I'll do it at lunch at some little cafe first. So we go to this little cafe in the Rue de Rivoli. It's half empty. Um, there, there's the waiter with the, the stained bib, you know, the, the glasses down like this, the, the messy hair, you know, the towel. And he comes up and I order. And he looks at me and says in very good English, is Monsieur certain he wants cream sauce on his tractor? <laughs> oh no I said we oui. uh, I have no <laughs> idea what I ate um, he didn't get a big tip from me um, but of course if you haven't been insulted by a waiter in Paris you haven't been to Paris hmm. and everybody every, and I love the French people um, I, I know that, I mean if it wasn't for the French we'd be speaking English I mean they, they're the ones that, no they're the without, we don't speak English we speak American but we, otherwise, we be speaking like this, Rachel, and mm -hmm. uh, all dearing me. Um, but but because <laughs> of the French helping us out in the, in the revolution, right? You know, we kicked the British out, and you know, etc. And they we fought alongside them in World War One. And yes, we fought alongside them in World War Two. You know, not at first, and but they came back in. They were always there. Um, and you know, we, they fought alongside us in Korea. They fought alongside us in uh, the first Gulf War. I had a friend of mine who was a Marine. On one side were British guards, the other side was French Foreign Legion. They didn't fight with us in the second Gulf War because, and a lot of people, Americans were upset about that. You know, they, they, you know, they made fun of the French and all that. And I said, but I said, you know, that's because friends don't let friends go to war drunk. Mm. <laughs> uh, so I have, I have a great affinity for the French people. Uh, of course, hey, how many games have I done? Napoleon, Napoleon started my gaming career, both in the first soldiers I painted were Napoleonic. The first board game I played, the real his, real war game, was Napoleonic, Waterloo. The first game I had published was War and Peace, which has been... War and Peace has been very, very good to me. Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, I'm still making money off it. Um, hell, I went to Europe on it, you know. Um, and, of course, the, games, the three games I did for you guys, Napoleonic Wars, Tuzov and Wellington, and Napoleonic Wars was done in a big, in a, a second edition and a and a double size edition. And there's a guy named Gareth who's apparently working on a third edition that oh. Tony wants to have done. I don't know when they're going to do it. Uh, just you know, because it's been out of print now for like 15 years. Um, yeah. But it still gets played at conventions, and uh, a lot of people still like it and write to me about it. But uh, so again, the, the, the things that are friends. And, and one summer, as a, I was a tour guide at Fort Ticonderoga. In upstate New York, it, wearing French La Marine regimentals, I was on the gun crew. I was on the, the musket drill, the whole bit. Um, and that's the summer I learned to drink and not to drink, because we had a Cohorn mortar and a three-pounder Galloper gun, and across the inlet was a wooden 
British soldier and a barrel. And twice a day, we fired each gun. And the deal was, if, you, if, if the cork cannonball from the three-pounder knocked over the wooden soldier, Mr. Pell, the museum director, whose family built the place, would buy everybody a round of beer on the crew. If you got the, the, cork, cannon, the cork mortar ball into the barrel, he'd buy them a case. Well, he hardly ever had to make good on this, except that summer. Because that summer, it was me and three guys from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute three engineers with slide <laughs> rolls, plums, and boom, bam, boom, boom, ding, bang, you know. <laughs> so, um, and a couple of years ago, and my son was little, so I, we, I drank way too much. I was 17. Um, the, uh, when my son was little, I took him over just to Quantaroga, and we do the tour, and the guy gives a speech, and I walked up to him, and I said, you missed two lines, because it was a canned speech. He says, what, what two lines did I miss? I said the whole thing about the the, the, the Scottish engineer and, and, and Mount Independence and the guns. Oh, I said, yeah. I said there was a thing when when Burgoyne came there to take to to attack Ticonderoga in the revolution. Uh, it's of course it's a, it's a great fortress, right? Well, the Scottish engineer looks over the Mount Independence and says he sees a goat climbing the mountain. And he goes, Where a goat can go, a man can go. And where a man can go, he can drag a gun. And so they, they drag two cannons to the top of the hill. They fire into the middle of the fort. Panics the Americans who run across the bridge, set fire to the magazine, and boom, there goes the Conor Rogan. So I, I have, you know, <laughs> an affinity for all that stuff. Yeah, I'm a font of useless knowledge. Um, but like the, the, the and I, like even getting into board gaming, I got in the because when I was in seventh grade, going to a mandatory voluntary uh, Saturday morning class for extra credit at my military school run by Irish Christian brothers. I still have the plumed helmet, helmet, hat up there and the sword. Um, it was an essay about what you got for Christmas. Well, my friend Dan Button said, I got this board game called Waterloo. Well, that Wednesday we played it. And from then on, I was hooked. <laughs> and I went to Georgetown, played miniatures in gaming groups and the whole thing. And in 1978, my wife and I we got married. We went to England for two weeks. Came back. We were both unemployed. The, my key didn't fit in my office. You know, they closed while I was gone. Uh, and she got to her, her office, and they had given her assistant her office and put her on a small office, and she just walked. Hmm. So I had time on my hands. I was looking for jobs, and I realized, you know, <laughs> I play Avon Hill games. Baltimore is an hour away, and I've been to Baltimore every month. For four years, because my college roommates are both from Baltimore, we go. They invite me home once a month, you know, have a home cooked meal, you know, have my laundry done with their families, no, Italian families, you know, so I'm an Italian neighborhood. I'm Irish, but Italians. And so I write to them and said, you know, I'd love to see your operation. I've played your games for years. Can I come up? So I, they said, yeah, sure. So I up there and I meet Don Greenwood, who was running the place, and he walks me around and show it. And I meet Mick Yule and you know all these other guys who work there. And um, Tom Shaw, who's the vice president of the company, uh, comes over to talk to Don and says, uh, we're still going to lunch, right? Hey, you want to bring your friend? Um, I said, sure. So we go to the Harvey House, a wonderful old-fashioned uh, restaurant in uh, Baltimore, famous for seafood and chowder and, and crabs. And I'm there spooning up some soup. And Shaw looks at me and says, okay, Mark, what's this game you came to pitch, us, pitch to us? Why well, hadn't I came up with a game? I, <laughs> place. I had, I had nothing. I had nothing. But I've known that when not, when a door opens, walk through it. <laughs> Over the course of lunch, I designed, pitched, and sold War and Peace. Wow. And after coffee, we go back and I sign a contract. No and I get back to my wife and said, wow. "That's what I'm going to do for the next six months." And that's that is I, crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, and because of War and Peace, I got three um, W, uh, the War Gamer magazine. You know, like that. Said, so what else can you? Do? What else have you got to design got going on? I didn't have anything, but I came up with No Trumpets, No Drums, which is a Vietnam War game, and then Holy Roman Emperor, um, which is a Thirty Years War game, which both of which were redone by one small staff and, and over the last ten years, <clears throat> and done nicely and done right. And I did, you know, I did East Wind Rain for them, which is being redone by Compass Games, and Army of the Tennessee, which are being redone by Compass Games, 
and Viceroys in Columbus, which are also for Task Force, which are also being redone by, by Compass Games. So, oh, everything is new again. Um, but now they're being yeah. done with modern graphics on mounted map boards uh, with really you know, upgraded, updated. The same games, nothing in the rules changes. It's just all better presentation, better artwork, better components, easier to play because everything is, you know, a lot more visible. Um, so all that stuff that I did, I'm, it, it's being recycled and improved and on all because of, you know, a Saturday morning class. <laughs> and they got me into wargaming. And wargaming is why I went to uh, Georgetown because I had a choice between Boston College and Georgetown, Jesuit schools. And uh, I saw an article in Time Magazine. Uh, Willie Brandt was Man of the Year, 1970. And there's Brigadier General Peter Young on page 68, pushing toy soldiers across a pool table in London. And so I wrote to Time Magazine. I wrote to the journalist. I wrote to Brigadier General Young. And I said, you know, I, I was fascinated by it. And I said, I'm going to Boston or, or, or D.C. Do you know anybody in either one of those places who, who, who plays this stuff? He says, well, yeah, my friend Kurt Johnson, who wrote a chapter in a book I wrote, um, is it called the war game? It lives in, in DC. That's why I went to DC. And because of wargaming, I got to Georgetown in DC, where I met uh, the Tatui brothers, who I played games with, uh, and one of whom uh, worked with me in Associated Press. And one day his car broke down, and I drove him home and spent the night in his sofa. In the morning, this beautiful girl comes out and says, Who the hell are you, and what are you doing on my sofa? <laughs> we were married for 47 years. She passed. Yeah. This is my first. This is my first Valentine's Day in forty-seven years without her. Mm -hmm. So today is a, a bittersweet day. Um, but I'm sorry, I have met somebody mm -hmm. else. I met somebody in London on my birthday. God looks out for me. Uh, who is absolutely wonderful, and I'm very much in love with. But because because of wargaming, I got a career as a game designer and a writer, um, and actually as a journalist, because it all kind of fell together because of all that. And I met the, the woman of my dreams and had children. It all comes back to, you know, the, a pivotal moment in history, you know, yeah. and I can trace the solid line. I can trace an unbroken line back through that. Mm -hmm. um, and because of gaming, not all, but most of my friends I, I've made and know, I met through gaming. Yeah, uh, like you guys. I, I, yeah. I mean, I've worked with Rachel, you know, uh, for the last couple of years, posting things about our games that I've designed. Uh, but this is the first time I've actually seen you face to face and talk to you. And same with you, Luke. Yeah. yeah. And I, I always, I think we already feel like we're friends. Yes. We have so much in common, and we know the same people, uh, and we all know and love the wonderful people who work for GMT. You know, as yeah. I said, you know. You know Tony, uh, who's basically the, the grandfather of you know everybody there, and <laughs> and, and, and 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 your dad, of course, who's you know a great mm -hmm. guy, and Simonich and and Andy Lewis and and the whole bunch of them, They're, and because they love what they do, and GMT Games, like most game companies, in our in our on our part in wargaming, most wargaming game companies, not so much in the bigger companies where games are just widgets, uh, you know they don't you know. They love the product. They play with the product. They they have they could make a lot more money with their time doing anything else, even babysitting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, but no, they put their time, their effort, and their love into the games, uh, just like the designers do, just like the artists do. Uh, and I can't thank the GMT people enough. Um, they're just wonderful, warm people. Um, all of you guys, you just, you're, great, you're a great support team. Um, and we get to have this wonderful smorgasbord of games that never would have seen the light of day uh, well, for you guys. And yeah, sure, there are ten, you sell, there's a board game which sells 10,000 copies, and there's another game which sells 500. But you know, they're both still out there. So the yeah. guys, and I play the game, I, I play Borg's games. I love his games, you know, the ancient, the Command and Color series. Although I don't play with blocks, I play with miniatures. <laughs> um, I have first. miniatures, so like I mean, the first time my friend brought over the first of his games, first of his games for you, I play Battlecry. But actually, I'm playing Battlecry today with a with a kid at a library in Keene. I usually do every Wednesday. I play Memoir a lot. Um, but his ancient Command and Color series, 
my friend come, comes there and he comes to my house. He takes the shrink wrap off and he opens it up and he sees blocks and stickers and his face just goes. <laughs> we'll be here all day doing stickers. We're going to play with I said, I said, screw the stickers. I didn't say screw. Um, put the, I said, you want Romans? How many? You want elephants? We got them. You want Carthaginians? Here they are. And so I put the miniatures on the board and they're 15 millimeters and on the bases they fit. And we would just use uh, casualty caps or pennies or actually we have paper hangers for the losses instead of taking we because you're not going to pull the soldiers of the bases and i still do i still do that way i still do, i do the polyoc ones that way um i do i do tricorn which is another company with same designer uh with miniatures um you know i i love playing miniatures because i love access and allies i love the toys on a, on a thing and, and when i design games i tend to use miniatures or risk pieces little soldier risk pieces um when i do it because i just love the feel of of toy soldiers yeah because uh, i mean we're all, it's, I mean, war gamers are basically, we're, we're playing army men. We're playing war like we did as kids, but we just, it, on, it just expanded, you know, to, you know, and, and it's a cheaper hobby than golf, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I tend to, because I, I don't, I haven't designed Hex Encounter since 84. That was, Eastwind Rain was the last Hex Encounter game I designed and one of the last Hex Encounter games I've played. Uh, other than, you know, somebody says you want to play a game. And like I played Joe Bukowski's Omaha Beach from the 80s a couple months ago. Because a friend says, I want to play this. Because as you learned on the schoolyard as you were a kid, if you want them to play basketball, you got to play baseball. Um, and that way everybody wins. You know, you want yeah. So uh, I'll play their games. I'll play my games. Uh, I, I rarely say no to any game. Uh, a mm -hmm. game puts miniatures around on a table every Friday night. Uh, I go to a board game garage day once a month. Uh, my friend's a big garage; has 20, 30 people there. I played um, the newest, the new coin game uh, on the, on India, the Gandhi, oh. uh, which was a lot of work, um, but fascinating because I know the history. I was the Raj; everybody else was against me because mm -hmm. there's they four players, and basically three of them want to take the, the Raj down. One of those three is going to win, so they don't like each other, but they all hate me. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and the end. Well, you know, and the enemy of my enemy, sure. my, my friend, for a, for a while. So, but it was fascinating because I know all the history on the cards, and I know all the, the stuff in India. So, you know, I, I I I tend to play those kind of GMT games. I tend mm -hmm. to play the coin games or like uh, Wilderness War or things like that. I don't play yeah. the Hex Encounter ones. Uh, I actually did not think I've ever played a GMT Hex Encounter game. To be honest with you, I know there's been wonderful ones out there, uh, mm -hmm. but it's just that doesn't what it's not what things to me. Um, to each his own. Yeah. To each his yeah. own, yeah. Um, I've seen them. I've seen people play them. Um, but I tend to go for the things that are a little, like, like I love the Atlantic Chase. And mm -hmm. when I went to the, um, the the convention in August at the Naval War College, uh, which, um, you know, the SDH, you know, mm -hmm. the, one he, the one that Harold runs, I got to play uh, Pacific Chase with the designer uh, against Mark Herman. <laughs> That's you know, and, and Mark, oh, Mark Herman and I go way back, uh, and we play each other's games, and we like each other's games, and we like to talk. Like, I remember once I went to GMT East when he was he was designing Pericles. Well, I was I knew all this stuff. Over, you know, I'm, I'm throwing quotes. We're throwing quotes back. I know who Alcibiades is. You know, um, yeah. And you want you want a quote from Aeschylus? Which one do you want? What play do you want? The, you know, um, and so it's it, it we're, we're kindred souls and yeah. of course at the, at the, at the summer convention we, we played a couple of games together I was, and i played a game with frank davis who was the guy who was my editor for war and peace he's doing some games too though. so you see old friends and you make new friends um so it's it's, yeah, it's a great it's a great hobby and one of my one of my best friends in the hobby uh was richard Burke, and i know he had a history of being a curmudgeon and a lot of people didn't like him, and they thought of him pompous because he would speak like ex cathedra, like he was the pope. He would also call himself the pope, even though he's Jewish, he calls <laughs> him the pope. But I liked him, he liked me, and I'll never say a bad word about, about Richard. He was a good hearted guy. People don't know he used to sing opera. Wow. He, mm. he, he, did the, he was the Mikado in a production of the, uh, of the Mikado, mm. uh, he was a lawyer. Uh, in New York, he met a woman, a woman, and moved to South Carolina. And Charleston is the oldest Jewish city in America, and for mm -hmm. and it actually had the largest Jewish population of uh, any city in America until the immigration wave of the in the 19th century. 
the first synagogue in America was in Charleston. First mm -hmm. Jewish school was in Charleston. But as he said, all this, you can't get a good chicken liver. <laughs> you can't get a real bagel. So every month he would have a, a care package shipped from Zabar's in New York. <laughs> You know, nice. you, know, um, you know, with the whole thing, the Kugala, the, the, the latkes, the whole things. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the only, you, you couldn't get a good schmear in, uh, in, in Charleston. That's funny. But, but yeah, but hey, once a New Yorker, everything all goes back to gaming. All to, to the first game I played as a kid, you know, the Milton Bradley games, to the, the, the Time Magazine, to the, the, the Saturday morning thing, to... It all goes back. My whole life has been, been built on games. All my friendships, my family, my loves uh, on games. Um, so what more can I say? Games bring people together in yep. more ways than one. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what you think about each other's politics or religion or beliefs. When you sit down at a gaming table, you're a gamer. And as long as you don't talk about the stuff that divides you, you talk about the stuff you have in common, the game, the system, the history of it, uh, the beauty of it, uh, whether it's painted soldiers, whether it's, um, you know, little wooden blocks with stickers on them, whether it's little cardboard counters or discs, you know, cards or, or whatever it is. Games bring people together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I game online. Uh, I'm actually involved in three different online games now with guys I know. I, I usually I Skype with them when I'm playing with them, except for except if we're doing the async where you do a turn every couple of hours or a couple of days. But I'll sit down for like on tomorrow for like two hours with my friend in New Mexico, headphones on, playing on Vassal. Um, or yesterday I was playing Terraforming Mars online with my friend Nate. Actually, lives about 20 miles away from me. Uh, I play with my son on Friday. I'm, my son and I are going to kill Nazis. Uh, he's in Oregon. We're going to do a company of heroes, but we're going to Skype while we do it. So you get, it's not the same as being in the same room or uh, looking across the same table, but you're still together and you're talking and you're not a faceless something. You know, you're not an AI. And I do play computer games. I play, I, I, I designed one. Uh, well, I said it's play tester, lead play tester. I won. I don't know. I, I couldn't program my way out of a paper bag. Um, <laughs> I, I took a year's course of programming. All I could make was seagulls going, eh. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I know where my talents lie, um, but no. I'm, so you guys are in the best the best business in the world. You get to you take history, you take games, you take art, you take friendships. It's great. Yeah, uh, I appreciate you guys. I think most gamers that play your games. Well, obviously, they appreciate you because every time they play one of your games, it's like saying a prayer to a thank you prayer to Gene and the rest of you guys. <laughs> so, um, well, thanks for saying that. That's kind of you. Yeah, we appreciate, appreciate you and all of our designers and design teams and artists and everyone who puts so much love into the games. Um, we just work on producing yeah. them and yeah, but that's an, helping that's you guys along. But that's an act of love as well. I mean, you. I mean, you guys could. You, you guys could make a lot more money doing almost anything else, but you wouldn't get. But where would you get the satisfaction, hmm. uh, the joy? And there are. I mean, life is too short to work just for money. That's true. Like I am very lucky in that I literally have never worked a day in my life. I sold my first piece when I was in high school, and except for six months where I worked part-time at, at stop and shop after the crash because I just needed to do something until I could rebuild my business. I've never worked a day in my life. Every day I write, whether it was journalism, was a, I was a journalist for 40 years covering war and terror and drugs and all nasty things, politics, um, or designing games or writing books. I don't feel like I'm working. I'm having fun. I'm getting, I'm making money for having fun. Um, I'm learning something and I'm having fun. And I just turned 70 back in November, and I will never retire. That to pry my cold, dead hands from the keyboard. <laughs> Mark, tell us a little bit about your book series. Uh, this is the uh, the first novel in, 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 a, in a group of six so far. The sixth novel in the series came out uh, last month. I'm working on the seventh. There'll be nine. It's called Throne of Darius. And it's a historical military fiction, very, very well researched. All, all, the, all the stuff that happens is real. 
Uh, some, of course, I invent some characters, but it's about the Greeks and Persians who fought against Alexander. Because mm -hmm. in my book, Alexander is not so great. Uh, and of course, in ancient civilizations of the inner sea, uh, which I did for you guys a couple years ago, there are scenarios that let you fight Alexander's early campaigns in Anatolia and down in through the Levant and into Egypt. But in, in ancient civilizations of the Middle East, which centers on Persia and goes all the way from you know, the tip of uh, Macedon all the way to, to the Indus, you can do the entire campaigns of uh, any Persian you know, emperor, um, the, you know, and from Cyrus beginning to the Darius revolts to, um, to Alexander's campaign. You mentioned the other day that you have more ideas for the series that you're working on. Can you tell us anything about that? Yes, the third in the Ancient Civilization series. And there's the, the map. Uh, let's see if I can see it. Okay, there's the, there's the, the hand-painted map. Uh, it's, there's China and Korea and Japan and all the way down to Southeast Asia. And it's, you know, that's, that's ancient civilizations of, the, uh, of East Asia, ACAA. And I finished the, 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 the working draft of the cards um, yesterday and sent them to my co-designer, Chris uh, Vorderbrug, and our editor, Fred Schachter, for them to comment on. Um, and they both have. So today, um, well, tomorrow, actually, I have to go through the 110 cards and make the, the corrections and suggestions they decided. Um, mm -hmm. And because the rules are already written, but, you know, it's, it, because it's a, it's, a, it's a system. I mean, each game of the system is, adds something or is different. And this again is a take that game. It's a civilization survival game. Mm -hmm. uh, the so, but instead of building um, wonders of the world like in the first game, or building deities in the in temples in the second, here you're doing like you're on a cultural track, and you're trying you're going to advance yourself on four different levels: religious, political, intellectual, military. And if you get in, the first player, and you get victory points for doing that, but if any player gets to, to the top where he has all four levels of all four of them. He gets the mandate of heaven and wins as an automatic victory. But there are so many other ways to win. And the game, like full solitaire rules, just like the other two, um, up to six players, um, hold more than a dozen civilizations so far. And they're not all Chinese. Um, I even have the peoples of the sea, which actually there were mass migrations uh, of, of people who came across into the islands and through Borneo and Sarawak and all the way, all the way into Malaysia, who hmm. were not some, they were, they were, they were not a civilization in the sense of a conquering empire or unifying, thing, but they were a mass movement of peoples. So that's one of them. But of course, there are the different Chinese, the, the Japanese, the Malays, the the uh, Siamese, the, the Cambodian, you know, Khmer, uh, and, and the Mongols, others in there as well. Uh, and you can be each of them is different. Uh, so you know, each of them has a special ability or more two special abilities that they can do. Uh, some appear at different eras. There's four epics in the game, and you can either go historically with only the the civilizations that were there historically in that period, or you can say, "Let's go free for all. And we'll put we'll pick six hmm. uh, or whatever you want." And there's an exploration game where you can play solo or with another player, where there's nothing on the map at start. It's a blank map. You put your first piece down, and you and you and you say, "I'm going here." And when you put a piece in the next space, you you pull a card, and the base of the number on the card, the last digit, tells you what you found. Instead of Ooh, so you I might like find, that. you might find gold. I, I, that's in the exploration game is in uh, the Middle East game as well. Oh, I'll have to play uh, that. <laughs> where you can you might you might find hostile tribes, you might find friends, you might find another empire, who may or may wow. not like you. You might find you might find some rewards, some gold, or something like that. Um, a very simple, uh, and you can play that solo, or you can play with say two be two you play, and there's you're exploring different ends of the map. And again, there are so many ways to win. But my favorite thing about all three of these games, and there'll be a fourth, hopefully, Ancient Civilizations of the Americas, mm. is but it's very hard to take a leader down. And so you get to the point where like everybody is playing for second or third place, or just, you know, what we what we decided, actually Chris came out very early on is hey, why don't we have we have all these bad event cards? Why don't we let the guy who's in last place? play them when they're drawn so a card is drawn and says invaders for this or if this happens here let him do it so <laughs> what that is it does three things one it means if you bound pound pound on a guy and push him down to the end he gets his revenge so yeah. so the thing is 
So you know, so be nice to the guys you play with. Or uh, it's the guy in last place is like, well, you know, I can't win, but I'm still going to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and, and of course, the guy in last place, if he's really, if he has very few pieces left on the board, can also take advantage of a rule. It's Aeneas in the first game, Gilgamesh in the second. Uh, I forgot that one of the third ones. I can't remember the name right now. Oh, him. Is you can say, I'm out, and you can keep his pieces to leave the table. He gets to keep his victory points. And comes in the next turn as one of the unplayed civilizations. So it's like I'm back, <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, you're sitting here nice and pretty, you know, the Romans, and all of a sudden the Gauls show up, <laughs> uh, and you weren't and you weren't nice to the guy who played the Gauls, so yeah. he's not going to be nice to you. So he gets a chance to get back in the game, take down the leader, have fun, and again, like all the games, you can play one to six players. You can play a combination of sol solitaire and humans. So you can have like one or two non-players. They, they have full rules for them. Um, and the game lasts as long as you want. There are four epics. Each can be four turns. However, each epic can end at the second or third turn. Uh, there are cards which end the epic when they come up. And you don't have to play a full game. You can say, we're going to play till the first guy gets 50 points. Or we're mm -hmm. going to play till 2 o'clock. Uh, and when the game is over, it's a full game. Yep, and you can start any part, period you want. You start with the first step, you know, and the same all three of them. So they're very flexible in that how many players, how long, what you do. So you always can finish a game. Uh, and again, they're intentionally meant to be not slow, methodical build up. You know, huddle your game, turtling down. They're meant to be dynamic. I mean, because like you have cards that you can throw across the map. Uh, other people. And I remember uh, one of the first games that, games of Ancient Civ I did at a convention, there were five guys in their 40s and 60s and a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> Guess who won? The um, kid. Hopefully. Yeah. And there were no dice. There's no dice involved. This is, so there's, there's no luck. You know? And he would say, like, I drew a volcano. Of course <laughs> I'm going to play a volcano! <laughs> you have to. Yeah. <laughs> How can you not? <laughs> um, I mean, you can save the card. So if somebody plays something on you which costs you pieces, you can use the card to save one of the pieces. But yeah, <laughs> oh, burn it all down. Fire, famine, plague, smog. You know, <laughs> invaders from the invaders. You know, um, you know, you name it. You know, assassins, traitors. Something appealing, something appalling, something for everyone. A comedy tonight. Nothing for kings. <laughs> nothing for crowns. Nothing for royal. No, no, no. That's what. No. That's yeah, from, that game was a blast when I played it. Thank you. Uh, the so, song is from it. A Funny Thing Happened to Me on the Way to the Forum by Stephen Sondheim, uh, who based it on one of the worst plays in Roman history by a second-rate playwright who wrote a play uh, in by 50 BC in a play in which the first time in history anybody called Alexander the Great. Alexander was never the great in his lifetime. Even Ptolemy, uh, his... Uh, general and the guy who found the dynasty in Egypt and who you know, wrote wonderful things about him, never called him the great. It's a play and there are ghosts and, they're, you know, and, there's, and it's, it's a farce. And the main character comes across the ghost of Alexander and says, oh, you think you're so great. It's stuck. <laughs> wow. and, and, and the Romans, especially um, Caesar and, the, and his crowd, ooh, he's the conqueror, he's great. Well, I want to be great. And if he could do it, I can do it. And that has, of course, been throughout history. That's Napoleon. Napoleon wanted to go to India. He wanted to outdo Alexander the Great. Hitler wanted to be a great conqueror. You know, everybody wants to be that thing. And I was taught in school, in, in military school, and in, even in Georgetown, <coughs> Alexander the Great. Until I was a journalist, and in the Middle East, I met an Iranian journalist uh, who was one of the guys who was with the people who overthrew the Shah, and not the Ayatollahs, the guys in the middle, the ben Benny Sadar, technocratic guys. And he says, Mark, Alexander's not so great in my country. My grandmother would say to me, be good or Ishkandar will get you. Ishkandar is Alexander. And he was the horned one. He's always portrayed with horns on his helmet. Um, so he's not so, you know, of course, he destroyed the Persian Empire and left nothing in the in, a, in, a, in a, He destroyed the greatest, most civilized empire of the world at the time uh, and left a ruin that for the next 200 years, his generals fought over. Um, and I got to, in, I met, I met a general in India, 
who says, Mark, you know, we stopped Alexander. Yes, he fought a great battle, the Hydaspes against King Porus. He won the battle. But after, at the end of the battle, he and Porus made an agreement. Porus said, okay, you win. You know, I'll be your, your, your friend. I'll, be, you know, I'll do things for you. But by the way, could you leave? <laughs> and Alexander, Alexander's soldiers were like, they, they had it. Alexander's soldiers, but 10 years, they've been, they've been they had war. They couldn't, they mutinied. And finally, he said, okay. And they, they fought their way down the Indus and then back across the desert at home. So the Indians stopped him. And there's an old joke, which is a 2,300-year-old joke, which the, the general told me. He says, Alexander comes to India. And like everywhere else he goes, he wants to have a cloak made. Sort of like, you know, a T-shirt. Like, you know, I, I went to London. All I got was this T-shirt. It was like, I went to Babylon. All I got this T-shirt. You know? um, <laughs> and he, it was beautiful cloth of gold gorgeous and he says to the tailor this is amazing how much cloth did you use to make this cloak and the indian tailor says oh i used it only two yards two yards why in macedon they need five yards of cloth to make a cloak he goes you're a much, much bigger man than macedon <laughs> um, that's a that's a 2300 year old joke you know stand-up comedians from the indus valley you know what can i say um, so, but that's why, well, that's what spurred me to start doing more and more research and to reread the ancient sources like Arian and Curtis and Diodorus and read between the lines. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I went, of course, went other books, you know, the, there are snippet, the, the lost book of, of Ptolemy snippets of which are exist in, uh, libraries all over the world, which have been put together in a way and other books from the, the era and even more and more modern historians as well. And. The point the picture comes across of a troubled megalomaniac who's not necessarily evil, but is driven because ever since he was a baby, his mother said, Oh, by the way, the king is not your dad. Zeus, Zeus impregnated me. Oh, so you're so you're so you're a demigod. Oh, and by the way, um, we're we're related to Hercules. Um, oh, and you know, you know that Achilles, you know, in the book you read, he was one of my ancestors. Um, so this guy from the, from childhood is told you're a god, you, you're the blood of heroes, you have a destiny to rule. The, you know, that plays on your head, you know. And then everybody, of course, loves your dad because he's a great general and he built the first standing army of the king. So now, now you got father issues, mm -hmm. and dad thinks you're effeminate. Uh, yeah, Philip thought uh, Alexander was effeminate. Philip actually had a daughter, Sinane. From another, from another one of his wives, an Illyrian princess, who tra he trained to be a, a, a fighter because the Illyrian women fought. They were warrior print. They were warriors, just like the Viking women. And there's a battle in which, instead of taking Alexander, he takes his sister along as his bodyguard. <laughs> and there is a battle in Illyria, and there is a scene, an episode which is very much like the episode in the Lord of the Rings, where Theoden is lying down there. And the Nas goes over, and you know, she comes out, you know, and you know, no man goes kill me. I am no man, whap. Uh, and he said, and Sinane saved, uh, which Alexander never forgave for stealing the thunder. And he had her married off to a second rate prince uh, when, when he was king. Uh, but you know, she had a history of her own. And actually, I wrote her story, is one mm -hmm. of two short stories in a book of short stories called Friends and Foes of Alexander the Great. Uh, and the first story is Sinane, Warrior Princess. And the second story is the greatest postman and second best swordsman in, sorry, the worst postman and second best swordsman in Persia, which is the true story of, how, of, of Darius. Because Darius was a postman. He, was, he, was, he wasn't even an Achmenid. Uh, he was a postman. If you, if, you, if you know anything about the Postal Service, you know, their, their motto, neither sun, neither sun nor snow nor sleet, etc. That was the motto of the Persian Imperial Mail Service, which Ben Franklin stole to be our motto. Wow. There was a 1,500-mile road, the Royal Road, which ran from uh, Anatolia all the way to the Indus. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were every 20 kilometers, there was a way station. The Pony Express was based on this, too, mm -hmm. and where the horses and couriers. And the couriers were not even allowed to carry so much as a dagger. Uh, and they would have the mail, and they would ride, and they'd get off, they'd change horses, they keep going, and so they could get a, a letter from one end of, 
of the of the empire to the other in under two weeks. Wow. Huh. This is on horseback. Uh, so and, and he was initially he was that, and his brother was the king's champion, uh, uh, you know, you know, champion swordsman. And there was a a, a war, uh, a rebel tribesman on the Caspian Sea, uh, had was a you know had risen up, and the king had gone to to fight them, uh, and they it was an impasse, so they decided they would fight with champions. Well, Darius's brother was the king's champion, but Darius's brother got sick, and so Darius and Darius happened to be there delivering the mail. Uh, and his brother said, fight in my stead. He goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> but he, he did, he won, and he became the king's champion. And that eventually led to, you know, all the palace intrigues and the coups and the murders and stuff like that. It's, you know, and that's wow. how he, you know, so yeah. The things I did not know until I started doing the research. So mm. I said, every day I read for my books or my games or for fun, I learn something new. And luckily, I get to put it into my games. It's a books. good philosophy to have. So, yeah. Well, um, I think I've taken up enough of your time. Unless you have some questions, uh, you're almost an hour and a half in. You know, I, I can. I'm Irish. I get to talk. You know. <laughs> yeah. My uh, my um, my grandfather said you have my German grandmother said you have the gift of gab, which is not necessarily a, um, uh, a compliment. Gab is a a creature and. Irish mythology, you know, um, and my, my history teacher um, in high school once, I did a I did a paper and I read it and I, of course I had made everything up. Uh, and he goes, Mr. McLaughlin, I should strike you in the mouth for what you've just read out, but my hand would come out ringing with bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> That's so, funny. So I'm a I'm a storyteller, but it's been an uh, absolute joy. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Um, we do have a couple questions that we like sure. to ask everyone. Yeah. First of all, do you have a favorite game by another GMT designer? I have a lot of favorite games by Richard Borg. Uh, I, pref I prefer Battle Cry and Memoir, but after that, it's the Anx his Ancients series. Uh, the, the Command and Colors Ancients, I think, is brilliant. I do like Command and Colors Napoleonics because I'm an old Napoleonics gamer. Um, and I like Tri and, well, Tri is not one of yours. But I like I like his game. So, so I'd say my favorite GMT designer of whose games I play the most is is Richard, uh, whom I I've known for years. I was a play tester I, before Command and Colors, uh, Civil War. Well, before Battle Cry became a Hasbro game, it was Command and Colors Civil War, and he was trying to sell it to Avalon Hill. So I play tested that in Avalon. Hill. So I've known him forever. Uh, and of course, Mark Herman. Who doesn't love Mark Herman? Yeah, he's a brilliant designer. His Pericles. Although combat system is indecipherable until you watch it online, is a brilliant design. Is a what is probably the most single most literate, you know, game anybody's ever designed. Mm -hmm. It's so deep in the literature and the feel and the the taste and smell of a, of, of 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 the Peloponnesian War. It's just absolutely brilliant. So though, yeah, so those two guys. Are my two, easily my two favorite, and there's a lot of wonderful other designers. You know, Mark Simonich. You know, he's been around forever. You know, uh, you know, he's it's not as old as me. Uh, most people aren't. Um, you know, <laughs> um, when I say those, 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 those are my GMT trifecta. Great, mm -hmm. you know, thanks. So definitely, you know. That um, kind of answers our other question, which was about uh, people who have a positive influence on you in the gaming hobby. Oh I yeah, mean, um, it uh, seems uh, to be it, similar. Yeah, it, it, again, I mean, I mean, like Richard Berg had a lot of uh, was a friend mm -hmm. of mine. Uh, Mark Herman, you know, uh, Borg, I don't know as well, but I have met him several times mm -hmm. over the course of the years. Uh, I'm, and I love his work, and I've met a lot of the other guys, you know, in the uh, Gupta and Matthews and all those other guys. I've met them, um, you know, so I, I know a lot of the guys, you know, and and uh, oh, who else? There's a whole bunch of other guys. His names are saving me at the moment right now. Uh, that I've met, you know, designers that I've met and played with, uh, all of whom have, you know, um, inspired me or at least made me feel part of the brotherhood, mm, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, which is interesting is this, you know, what I, there's a lack of sisterhood. <laughs> I mean, well, other than other than you and Kai, uh, you know, <laughs> are there any other women in GMT? Uh, you know, uh, well, it depends on who you ask, but we, a lot of our office staff are women. Yeah. 
But I mean, as and far they as, you do know, so much work for us. Oh yeah, but I mean, as far as in the in the game, I mean, yeah, they're in the the the, the business end of it. But in terms of the designing and working on the games, mm-hmm. other than Kai, who's done a wonderful did a wonderful job, it was right. Chad, uh, her late husband, did was my editor developer for Ancient City of the Inner Sea, and he and she took over for the Middle East. And modeled it on his thing, and she then she took over the remake of um, Hitler's Reich because the original rules were not as clear as they should have been. Uh, we didn't have, we didn't change any rules, but the presentation was not done as well. Mm. She did that better, which is why for Hannibal, I re-engineered Hannibal to to mirror all the things she had done to make it to make the rules clearer, cleaner, and more logical. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And well, again, I always work with editors. Even when I was a kid uh, in high school, and all the way through now, I have an editor for my books, I have the editors for my games, and a writer or a designer who doesn't use an editor is a fool. It's like taking, it's like Kirk taking up the Enterprise and leaving Scotty at the dock, <laughs> because editors, I designed something, I know what it says. I wrote something, I know what it says. Another looks at it and says, "That's not what it says," and nine out of ten times they're right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, they 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 finish, they polish, they they take. They, 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 it's sort of like a car, you know. I'm you know, brains by Mattel, their body by Fisher. <laughs> 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 they make they, they make they make the car go they make the car go around. So mm. uh, yeah, so I mean, Kai is a is a wonderful editor. Uh, and you've done such marvelous work, Rachel, uh, supporting you know all the games we do and the and the, and the, and the blogs and the, and the postings and everything and just and putting piecing things together and you know taking art and stuff like that you know and just you know bibbity body boop boom you know, uh, you know so you, I mean you, you're the Disney princess of GMT. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll put that on my business card. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and you can get a wand and a gown, you know, in the Disneyland, you know. Uh, you know, so uh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. So, so what else you got for me? Uh, I think that's it today okay. for GMT Talk. So, thanks, Mark, for taking the time to talk with us and for being our guest. Oh, my pl- absolute, my absolute pleasure. Absolute yeah. pleasure. Yeah. It's been and fine. Great. So glad to get to meet you. And again, happy Valentine's Day. Live long and prosper. Right. Game on, dude. Game on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So thank all right. you so very much. Okay. All right. Thank we'll you. see you next time on GMT Talk. Oh, I'd love to. Take care. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.